Hey, welcome to Brighter Rays. This week we're looking at a study called When I Was a Son. It's Proverbs 4, 1 through 13. Back when I was a kid is a phrase that we often throw around as we get older. You know, back in my day, we didn't have smartphones. We played outside. What are we trying to do? At least what I think most people intend to do is instill in the younger generation wisdom that was gained when we were younger. This desire to train up and impart wisdom to those coming up behind us is very godly and biblical. It is, in fact, a command and one we should take notice. What we find in Proverbs chapter 4 is one of those back-in-my-day moments. Solomon is going to tell us tell his son about when he was a kid. Now, we've already talked about the benefits of gaining wisdom, and we revisit it again. We revisit it again here. The repetition of the main theme is designed to instill in us necessity for growing in wisdom. Here we'll find some of the necessities of teaching wisdom as well. I think we can agree that Solomon believes, and hopefully we would as well, that a wise person leads a different life than others. When it comes to children, those who are taught wisdom grow up with different standards and expectations of life. They are, according to the world's standards, weird. That's what I want my kids to be, weird in this world, weird to this world. Now, several years back, I came upon this list called How to Make a Child a Delinquent in 12 Easy Steps, which was thought to be compiled by a police captain many, many years ago. Now, I'm going to give this to you as an example of really the devil's counterpart, the world's counterpart, to what we will be looking at today. This is what people do who are not wise with their children. Here we go. Number one, begin at infancy to give the child everything he wants. In this way, he will grow up to believe that the world owes him a living. Number two, when he picks up bad language, laugh at him. This will make him think he's cute. Number three, never give him any spiritual training. Wait until he is 21 and then let him decide for himself. Number four, avoid using the word wrong. It may develop a guilt feeling. This will condition him to believe later when he is arrested for stealing a car that society is against him and he's being persecuted. Number five, pick up everything he leaves lying around, books, shoes, clothes. Do everything for him so that he will be experienced in throwing all responsibility on others. Number six, let him read any printed matter he can get his hands on. Be careful that the silverware and drinking glasses are sterilized, but let his mind feast on garbage. Number seven, quarrel frequently in the presence of your child. In this way, they will not be too shocked when the home is broken up later. Number eight, give a child all the spending money he wants. Never let him earn his own. Why should he have things as tough as you had them? Number nine, satisfy every craving for food, drink, and comfort. See that every sensual desire is gratified. Denial may lead to harmful frustration. Number ten, take your child's part against neighbors, teachers, and policemen. They are prejudiced against your child. Number eleven, when he gets into real trouble, apologize for yourself by saying, I never could do anything with him. Then number 12, prepare for a life of grief. You will be likely to have it. Now, you might find that somewhat humorous, but this is really the world's playbook. Of course, they do all these things, early number 12, which always catches them off guard. They don't realize why they have a life of grief, but because they haven't used wisdom in all the different ways that they've trained their child. Solomon would have us remember the old, well-worn paths of wisdom. We need to remember the wisdom of the wise as they imparted God's wisdom to us. So that's our introduction for our study. Next time we'll look at verses 1 through 3 in Proverbs chapter 4. So we'll come back to that and uh, we'll get started.